Okay, the last session. I will now <coughs> uh, go through some some indicators of uh, the the connection between urban structure and uh, and how people actually choose to travel. We will start with. Uh, this one, <coughs> which uh, says something about the typical pattern for t trip distribution. This is the, the hour of the day and the percent uh, of, uh, of travels. And uh, the bars are divided into different travel purposes. Uh, the big one at the bottom here for the morning peak is, of course, travels to and from work. So what you see here is <coughs> two busy, very busy periods where the capacity in the transport network is uh, is kind of under pressure in many in many cities. Uh, <coughs> and there are different purposes, as you can see here. Uh, but the main driver for for uh, for the peaks are the let's say the work-driven and from work driven uh, purposes. You have combinations of to and from work with other purposes as well. So what, what can we use this for? <coughs> if you are, for instance, considering a road pricing scheme, what you do with the road pricing scheme is that you price the peak periods quite high here and here and people may go for free outwards in, to in the evening and in the early morning and perhaps also through the middle of the day so that is what you do so <coughs> then you can have an impression of which groups will be affected by by such a such a, a means for let's say regulating the transport. If you manage to get rid of, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, some of the leisure trips, which are these ones, they are normally much more price sensitive to the road fares than others, then you may get rid of quite a lot of the peak problem in the afternoon, for instance. If you don't do road pricing and if you have pressure on capacity, <coughs> you see that some groups with, uh, at the outset, a rather low willingness to pay will be there and cause congestion. So you can say something about who will be affected uh, by this and you can use it when you know what characterizes leisure travel, let's say in terms of price sensitivity or price elasticity as compared to those who are <laughs> rather inelastic and which goes to and from work, less price sensitive, you can say something about what, what is likely to happen here. It can also say something about the potential for peak spreading. This tells us that the potential for peak spreading is much larger in the afternoon than in the morning. So <coughs> you can ch charge higher in the morning if you need to, because you know that uh, uh, you need to do that to, to, uh, to get rid of some of the traffic. That you perhaps need to do in the afternoon to achieve the same reduction. So this is market knowledge, and you need, well if you're going to, <coughs> to design at a, at a very, let's say, low level uh, planning, where you are, are deciding upon not land use, not uh, the way you should, or where you should locate uh, office buildings or anything like that, but here we are focused on how to mitigate capacity problems in, in the transport network. This type of market information is, is crucial. 
selection of Norwegian cities. Do you find the same pattern in the it's it's quite generic, actually. This is a more particular, a more particular piece of information for these uh, these uh, this sample of Norwegian cities. Uh, but behind this picture is a story about density. Let's talk a bit about density. Oslo with a large monocentric structure, dense, high share of public transport as a share of all motorized transport as compared to the other cities, which are smaller and uh, <coughs> where the quality of the public transport network is different and, uh, and the capacity problems are not that pronounced. So, so the incen incentives to use the cars are, are stronger than. Then <coughs> we are back to the more sort of generic uh, picture. This is so the number of residents in the urban area defined as, uh, as the number of inhabitants inside of the commune borders that consist that constitutes the, the urban area. So what we see here is as the, <coughs> as the number of residents increases, but we need ideally to correct for, let's say, also the density. But we see here, based on this Norwegian sample, that the car use is diminishing with the, with the size of the, of the urban area. And public transport increases. Pedestrians constitute quite a between one quarter and one fifth of the of the movements throughout the throughout the day. This is a work day, and that type of transport is uh, is not paying too much attention to actually. But it it is a quite important, uh, uh, quite strong share of of the of the movements. But remember that this is in essence smaller cities uh, even if uh, Oslo has 600,000 um, but it is uh, all of them have let's say concentration of shops and workplaces that allows for for some pedestrian activity here we have <coughs> the transport mode choice by population density in areas over 50,000 residents, which starts to be a significant or a pronounced city, and with uh, trips longer than 50 kilometers. This is wrong, it should be less than, not greater than, but less than. I'll correct that before you get it on, on the on frontier. So we see that and here we have the density again with 20 plus residents per per day car and we see that uh, non-motorized transport and public transport takes the lion's share of of the transport activity which is contrary to less dense areas even if the city is defined as being larger than 50,000 so this also underlines the fact that density matters here. Uh, <coughs> this is one quite recent example of planning. It's taken from Oslo. This is the main railway station. And this is a, a, a block of office, combined office and, uh, and residence located close to the railway station. So they tried <coughs> to achieve, let's say, a kind of political goal, objective, to condense 
or increase the density and, uh, and try to make it attractive to use public transport. The train station <coughs> and you have the subway station up here and the bus station is somewhere around here. And so far it seems to work quite well in terms of, uh, of uh, share of the movements done by other modes than car. You don't find many parking places. There is one underneath the buildings, but it is expensive and, uh, and has limited capacity. And the seabed, seaside, is in front here. So this is a planned uh, row of uh, office buildings, and, uh, and you have the opera and uh, the future Monk Museum and things like that in the area. But it's, a tr it's an attempt to use modern urban planning approaches. This is job density. Uh, and we see the same pattern as for residents. This is the number of jobs, workplaces, within one kilometer from the residents. Increases with increasing density. In Trondheim, city, largest city up north from Molde, some four hours drive or half an hour by, by air. They tried to, in the 70s, to build satellites connected with good bus services to the city center. And the satellites consisted of residential areas and workplaces. So uh, the city center, something like this, and one satellite here with bus connections and one here. And the satellites were, say, around yeah, some 10,000 people, perhaps, or less than that, 5 to 10,000. And the idea was that people should live here and they should also work here. So we had a, a bunch of companies and workplaces. The problem is that you cannot regulate the linkage between where people live and where they work. So this caused a lot of movements between, let's say like this, through the city center and even to a satellite out here. So the transport work or the, the production of uh, vehicle kilometers increased after this nice planning was fulfilled because people lived here and worked other in other places. So the, this is a very clear picture of the, uh, the relationship between density in terms of job places and, uh, and uh, how close the jobs are to where you live. So the big picture is, is nice. In practice, it depends. Because in this area, this picture may, might be valid. But for a more dis dispersed suburban structure, you never know. This is, uh, <coughs> again, a panel showing car use and density for, uh, for shorter trips, less than uh, 100 kilometers. And there is a tendency that, uh, that as uh, density uh, increases, um, the <coughs> percentage of car use also decreases. This is uh, just showing that density means better public transport systems. So the root cause is there, but the root cause underneath this level has to do with uh, urban planning. Whether they have, for instance, been successful in, in uh, planning the suburbs so that it is possible to serve them with public transport. There are many linkages here, as you understand.
again transport mode by distance to city center for for uh, let's say fairly sub substantial uh, cities and shorter trips so with distance uh, car use increases so also <coughs> This is also a lesson that we can learn that it is uh, it is good to try to even if you create satellites chains like this, it is always better to try to link them as close in terms of distance distance to the city center as possible. This is the final panel of uh, let's say relationships between density and, uh, in this case, uh, the use of subways. Where, uh, again, put Barcelona, the dense city, high usage of, uh, of uh, metro as compared to this dispersed Atlanta. And there is a rel relationship here. You see the trend line here with <coughs> with an um, the exponent of 0 0.6459 and i think this is uh, this terms the growth in terms of millions of passengers as you move out or as you increase the density of this this system don't care about that. The only thing I want you to, to see once again is that, that density matters when it comes to usage of the mass transit networks. Then <coughs> all these nice panels and data and relationships ca needs to, or the, um, many of, uh, or much of this information is relevant for, for planning purposes. And when you plan something, it's always necessary to have some indicators that you can measure up against. Try to see what you have achieved. Try to, f to establish a set of indicators so that, it that you can measure the development pattern from before the action is, is taken or the steps, planning steps are taken and try to measure what did actually happen after the, the um, let's say, a new transit link or a new suburb or whatever. How has this affected uh, certain indicators? And I'll show you some of them. But in general, <coughs> indicators, they should be relevant for the decision makers that is what is said here relevant for the decision makers they should be uh, addressed towards conditions or variables that can actually be in influenced by the planning urban planning process comparable nice to be able to compare compare different cities can learn a lot from that and also consistent over time. They should be not too complex. Uh, that links a bit up with this one. But it should be possible to measure them robustly over time and to understand what they actually uh, consist of. And <coughs> of course, the data shul should be available. And this scientific demands for reliability and validity goes together with these three factors. They have data, they are comparable, and that they are robust. And understandable. And I could also add acceptable to the public in general.
Yeah. So <coughs> these indicators and the way we try to measure uh, things is of course rooted in some type of understanding about causes and events from a planning process. And here we have some linkages. I have talked about this already. But social driving forces, societal driving forces in urban areas is, is, uh, is of course uh, of, uh, of importance. Um, you can consider that as, for instance, growth in population, change in preferences, as we have seen in, uh, in the Norwegian society. People have actually a stronger preference for living in urban areas now than they used to have 50 years ago. Which is a force that is not necessarily related to income or to other, let's say, classical economic factors. Can be other determinants behind that. The classical relationship between income and the use of a private car, historically, that has been quite strong. That the elasticity of income with respect to car use has been positive and with a number around unity, meaning that if you earn 10% more, you tend to drive 10% more. But that chain has been broken, as we shall see. And the reason is not connected to, it, 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 it can be explained by, by a shift in preferences. Because people are more wealthy than ever. But anyway, <coughs> this, this affects the demand and behavior when it comes to transport. We see that income now in urban areas causes less car use, not more. But people who are, are wealthy and well educated, they tend to drive less. And that is something that we haven't seen before. During the last 10 years, this has become quite, quite emergent. And then we have, this is more on the, on the, let's say, mode choice, whether they use car or public transport. Uh, it has to do with land take, design of urban networks and so on. How it impacts welfare distribution and urban vitalization effects, meaning that uh, the good urban space is also an important factor for understanding urban growth. If you go to Rome in Italy, for instance, in the historic center, the Romans, they had a very good understanding of the link between the human nature and the urban space. I think they are one of the best of that. Small spaces, defined urban spaces, attracts a lot of tourists and, and residents. The dispersed structure, where nothing happens, no spaces, just open, an open urban concrete landscape is the opposite like Dallas or parts of Atlanta, where nothing goes on and the growth is taking place not in these areas but in some suburbs. And then how this can be merged through a planning process. So I can show you then <coughs> an example of, uh, of some indicators. If we try to boil down and to, to make things a bit more specific, we can try to, to
to dig out some, some indicators based on various data sources. SSB is the National Bureau of Statistics in Norway. COSTRA is a, is a database for, for, uh, for the Nor Norwegian municipalities where you can, where you can uh, get hold of this data. So you have percentage growth in population, share of high um, the high education level share, and you see all the the uh, the uh, drivers that can be an explanatory factor for urban development. Density, uh, employment rate, age. We could add gender as well, travel times, so on. And then <coughs> we can continue with an indicator, indicator set of transport, where we collect data for mode, transport mode share use and uh, the use of transport modes in percent. Uh, daily uh, daily kilometers as a car driver, minutes as a car driver, number of travels per day, and so on and so forth. I'll show you what they can be used for later on. And this is NTS is a national travel survey. SSB is uh, that's still the National Bureau of Statistics. And then we can have environmental indicators like uh, walking, cycling pathways, emissions from, uh, from road transport, global emissions, and so on. And I'll show you a very, very simple relationship which is interesting and where some of these indicators are used. This one <coughs> shows the relationship between growth in greenhouse gas emissions from car use and personal income. Greenhouse gas emissions are, uh, it's quite simple to measure that because you can, uh, can get statistics of, uh, from, uh, from the uh, SSB on uh, sales of petrol in given areas. So what we see here is that as income increases, the growth, there is still growth in car use or uh, let's say use of, uh, of petrol or diesel, but the growth diminishes as we approach this area. So in the high income municipalities with the high <coughs> growth income, the growth in energy use or petrol use for cars, the growth is at the lowest. And this is con contrary to what we have seen before. So then there is a decoupling going on, which is a rather new phenomenon a decoupling between economic growth or income growth and the use of uh, motorized transport. So the, let's say the, uh, the, the typical link where you earn more, you buy a more expensive car and you drive a lot more. That is about to be broken and we need to explain this from other variables than just the relationship between income and, uh, and, uh, and wealth and, uh, and the use of, of car, cars. Okay, so if we then can establish a link like this based on indicators of uh, petrol sales and income, for and here some s s uh, a lot of cities are used as as the unit of analysis we can run a regression uh, analysis 
and we find a line here which is kind of giving us the relationship between income and, uh, and the use of, uh, of fuel for, for cars. And if we are able to say something about future development in income, we can perhaps expect that as we as cities become more prosperous, we may not be in the need of planning for so much, let's say, road usage as we have been forced to do in the past. I have been responsible for analyzing the transport plan for Tunsberg, this city. And uh, the forecasts for vehicle kilometers has been a strong growth. And I said to them at one point in time, where is your ambitions here? Why don't you want to attract businesses from Oslo, get an uh, income growth like Stavanger, and perhaps you can do with less road capacity, and you will experience perhaps a less growth in car use than, is, uh, than what you have forecasted based on rather conventional assumptions of the linkage between car use and, uh, and income then. So we ran some sensitivity tests on that. What if, what if Tansberg becomes like Stavanger in terms of income? What will happen with the demand for road transport by private cars? So you can use this indicator set to, to also make forecasts or scenarios for future ur urban development. In, uh, in, let's say, any city, if you believe in this relationship. Another <coughs> interesting line here is the, the link between education and car use. Again, lower car use as we move up here, higher education as we move out here. There is, of course, a, uh, a correlation between income and education. But when we talk about education, we are starting to approach variables that are more, let's say, drivers of changes in preferences, if you see what I mean. Highly educated people may have other norms, simply. that can affect this picture in the, in the future and make, make changes. So we have, uh, <coughs> and there are of, of course other factors behind here, like Oslo with the high density and the good public transport network is on top when it comes to low car use. So it's not only education that matters, but the relationship between education and car use, the data, is captured with a ratio of 0 0.8, meaning that the variation in this data set is explained at a ratio of 80%. So the analysis is not too bad, even if you perhaps should have seen 100. But if you see 100 in a regression equation, you should be very, very skeptical. But that's another story. This is not the course in statistics. But there are linkages which can inform forecasts for, let's say, more or less distant future here. Yeah. I will end. <coughs> I will end this uh, by saying a few words about parking and the availability of parking. And this is shows a relationship between public transport use and the availability of free parking at your job, like here. 
or you can park for free at the at the college's uh, parking lot. This is share of public transport. No free parking, free parking. Travel time by public transport relative to travel time by car. It's another way of using indicators, right? So you can see here that parking matters. It matters a lot. If you invite people to, to go to work and park there for free, you drain out the market for public transport. And then particularly in cases where the market is thin already, this can matter quite a lot for whether you are able to have a good and high frequent transport, public transport system or not. So uh, <coughs> in, in some cases it could be worthwhile considering uh, some kind of payment. I will not suggest that here because I want to not be stabbed in a dark night somewhere <laughs> <laughs> on the college. <laughs> but um, you, you get my point. So this is, uh, this is a summary of this, uh, this lecture. It's, uh, it's very condensed. Uh, I'm just telling the story about uh, density, public transport, and the path dependency problem. But hopefully you have gotten an idea of some drivers, some factors, some indicators, some relationships that uh, matters when we do urban planning and where transport systems is a very important component. So I managed to use three hours. So then I stop. Thank you.